Welcome. 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 Don't be intimidated by the pits on the wall. <laughs> the place today is occupied. So one of my goals in Museum of Louisville is, is to preserve, protect, and explain the history of art and culture. So one of my blessings is that I know some most amazing women who dedicate their work to this kind of interrogation of culture. So when the Armory invited the Museum of Louisville Image to assemble a group, I said, we can do that. I said, but we're going to raise the ante. Because rather than be a stage 20th century panel, we were going to embrace hip hop culture and make it a cypher. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. and, and rather than simply film it, this is going to be in VR. So I hope everybody saw the sign that you, you are in it now because we're shooting 360. So, um, in, 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 the, in the tradition of openness and freedom, the male in the room is going to step aside and let the tennis <laughs> They got your mic. Thank you. Cheryl Antonio, NYU teacher. Today, we start with the past. Whose past? Our past? Is there a shared past? Let's find out. Cheryl. Go ahead. Shala Lynch, filmmaker, curator. We're going to reclaim the past. Claim it. We're going to vindicate the past, and we're going to name some women who made films from the past. How about Vander Zee's sister? Who knew? Whoa. Whoa. How about Paul Robeson's wife? Woo! <laughs> How about Thornia Hurston? There we go. The first uh, feature filmmaker out of Kansas City. I'm Cheryl Hill, filmmaker. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And who knew that until 1925, 50% of the women working in Hollywood, 50% of the people working in Hollywood were women. And only when it became more expensive and Wall Street entered, the men came in. 50% behind the camera, writing, making the work, director were women. And probably underpaid. So we stand on the shoulders, particularly people like myself who are producers, we stand on the shoulders of on Maria P. Williams and uh, uh, Toussaint, Madame Toussaint. Monique Gabriela Kernan, actor, creator. I use my past to redefine my present. Maria on Sesame Street was the only representation of someone that I could look to that seemed some reflection of myself. And I went through a phase of, you know, turning down a lot of maid roles, but here I am now to change that story. And so that's how I am using the past to redefine the present. I am Tony Tice the Red. I'm a filmmaker, also actor sometimes. Uh, and I think about the past, I think about the past in film, I think about how women were represented and usually as props. So my work is to make sure that that changes because we are, we can do all things that men can do, uh, whether we, you know, it can be anything, so I think that we need to start changing the way we look at beautiful women because we are not just props, we are brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Raquel Gates, scholar, College of Staten Island. Um, I want us to think about the ways that even the way that we talk about the past is informed by a certain type of sexism. The fact that we talk about directors and not the editors, the screenwriters, the costume di directors, the like Edith Head, why aren't we talking about her as an auteur? All of that is defined by men. Um, and so the language has to change and the framing has to change as opposed to just thinking about how we slot women into those spaces. I'm Brandy Monk Payton. Uh, I'm an educator scholar, and I'm here to talk about how the archive is present with us every day. I'm here to talk about the actresses. Ruby Dee in 1966 uh, said that black actresses were tattered Negroes, um, that they were tragic and needed to be visible, and so we're here to bring that visibility to them. Mm -hmm. yes. And speaking of the archives, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Ooh. Ruby Dee and Ossie Davis archives, mm -hmm. Oscar Bichot's archives. Kathleen yes. Collins archives. Oh, Speaking oh, of oh. Kathleen Collins, I produced her first film and her, her film, uh, Losing Ground. And, uh, and Kathleen Collins was a really uh, a person who was trying to bring a different image.
to the screen. She's a complicated person. We have complicated relationship, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, she's somebody that we should honor because she bought the real past of maids. And she, in her film Losing Ground, she really wanted to bring forth a different kind of woman, a woman who was uh, a scholar who lived a, a, a complicated life. She wasn't a servant. She wasn't subservient in any way. And, and that's part of her contribution. She also had a big thing, if you ever get to see her, her class that she taught at Howard University, about she, she felt that black, as black uh, filmmakers, we are always compelled to do either the saint or the sinner. Mm -hmm. And we don't just deal with everyday, ordinary life. And that's something that, um, that's the past, not that far in the past. Except the documentary past. filmmaker, Madeline Anderson, I am someone. Madeline Anderson was one of my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't this the truth? But isn't this the truth? We should be telling the stories of the brothers and sisters, the sisters that came before us, so we know them, so we have their names. I you know, oh, it's yes. not just about the Google going to the archives. Right. They should, we should have present the hundred women. The, the, the invisible, hundred years. Right. Yes. The invisible visible. I think one of the things we should talk about with the past, too, is that the past seems so far away and unconnected. So when we think about filmmakers, people say so-and-so is a pioneer. And they're not. They were the pioneers. But what happened in between is what we have to mend. You know, the lack of funding. Because that's a big thing in independent film always, and particularly with us. Yes. Well, I'm a self-taught filmmaker, Ursula Young. I do documentaries. And my past, because I'm self-taught, is very present. I watch films like Shaw as, um, as part of my self-teaching. and. Speaking about archives, um, I come from the Asian American community, and archives have like a real problem because the, va the value of certain stories um, has not always been the same for different communities. Um, recently, in Chinatown, Moka, the Museum of Chinese and Americas, um, suffered a great loss because it was a huge fire in their building, and thousands and thousands of archives may have been lost, um, physical <laughs> archives. And we, um, my community is a community that doesn't, that community, that, um, that museum was started because men had been walking around and seeing that the, the stories of these communities were being thrown out in the trash. They literally were pulling out things from the trash mm -hmm. to be able to preserve them, and now some of that could be lost. But we have a lot of people in the community that don't realize that all these stories are valuable because they're not being valued by the greater work of the community. Right. And they are the vindicating evidences. So I had to name the past. So scholars before me, Donald Bogle, Awesome, awesome, My friend. gave me a past, right? Blacks in American film and television. Uh, oh, Mulattoes, yeah, oh, Bowser. 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 but he gave me an idea with Tom's Coons, Mulattoes, Mammies, and Bucks. So I renamed my women matriarchs, rebels, adventurers, and survivor thrivers. Yes. I, my women. I have a question for you ladies, okay? Can we talk about female sexuality, how it was portrayed in the past in film? Got to talk about Wesley Snipes, okay. to Wong Fu, seen it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks yes. for everything, Julie Newmar. Mm -hmm. We can also talk about Tangerine. We can, we can talk, talk, talk about Pariah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but we can also talk about in the past how the women were either desexualized, they didn't have sexual, or hypersexual. Yeah, they, they were the hypersexual or no sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, there was a contract, and I think either Hattie McDaniel's contract, she could not lose weight. She did not. She had to gain weight. She had to be unattractive to certain people. I think she crossed over. Got Rick Reese, I didn't say that before, filmmaker, choreographer. I want to call in the room all the sisters from the continents, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. Africa, yes. mm -hmm. diaspora. diaspora in general. They're also here. They have been cuisine palsy. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Martinique. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to jump in and talk about the ways that labels and categories and naming also sort of obscures the way that these actresses and performers have actually functioned in front of the camera. So if we call somebody a mammy and we sort of dismiss them as a stereotype, as if we don't pay attention to the fact that in Gone with the Wind, Mammy and Rhett Butler have far more sort of verbal chemistry in their scenes together than he ever does with Scarlett O'Hara. And if all of that has to be subsumed by putting her in a head wrap and making sure that she can't lose weight, if he just missed somebody like Nell Carter and give me a break as being a mammy, as if every single scene she had with that white man that she lived with was not sort of like undergirded by racial tension, right? I want us to think about the ways that those labels prevent us from actually thinking about what's happening in the performances. Yes, yeah. and the historians, right? How we cast women. Women are so, wear so many different bonnets, right? Because you're a mother, because you're a sister, you're a wife, should not denigrate your work. 
one. Number two, also that behind the scenes, the work behind the scenes as producer, as editor, as et cetera. Yes, and I, I want to talk about, touch on what you said. When we talk about representation in the Mammy, when you said that, I started thinking about the fact that that had to be intentional because black women have never really been framed as sexual unless they look a certain way, like a tragic mulatto. But what I learned from Dr. Leonard Jeffries from City College is that whoever controls the images controls the self-esteem, self-development, and self-preservation of a people. So now I'm kind of jumping ahead. We're in a time, we're in an era where we can make our own content and we can control the narrative, and we must, and we will. Yes. Yes. Well, as I'm counting the ladies from the past, I want to name Lena Horne. Yeah, yes. Ruby Dee. Ruby Dee. These are women who. Catherine Dunham. Catherine Dunham. Yes. 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 Diane and, Carroll. And those who played yeah. in big business, but also worked on the side and found ways to make money. Like, we don't have to starve. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't take away from our art. And Nina Mae McKinney. Nina Mae McKinney. Yes. yes. Think about saying the name of the actress, not the name of the film. Mm -hmm. yes. Say the name of the actress. You mean like Carmen Jones? Yeah. <laughs> Just say the Dorothy name of the Jones. film. If you write down the names of the film, sometimes they have a negative connotation. But if you write down the name of the actress, it changes the conversation. Mm -hmm. yes. Very true. I think this, when, we, when I think about that, I think about uh, Gabby Sidibeck. Mm -hmm. People call her precious. Mm -hmm. They yell that name out. And it kind of like, that kind of desexualizes right. her in a way. Jump in. <laughs> Jump in. Yes. I just want to give a shout out to Cheryl Dunye and the Watermelon Woman, which I just taught uh, this past Friday, and just thinking about the ways in which uh, lesbian identity has been on screen. Uh, that first feature film which is really amazing, but also thinking about the mammy uh, and thinking about deconstructing that gaze uh, is really important. So we're going to stop right now and jump into a little five-minute break where you guys can ask next <laughs>